You are listening to a sermon by Dr. Richard Caldwell produced by Walking in Grace. Walking in Grace is a listener-supported ministry. Visit walkingingrace.org media to learn how you can help these messages reach more people. Good evening, and if you would please join with me in turning to the book of Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, and we read again beginning with the first verse, we will read down to the fifth verse, Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Justification by faith peace with God, permanent access to God, free access to God through our Lord Jesus Christ, stationed in the grace of God, standing in His grace forever. The knowledge of these things flows out in joy. We rejoice in the certainty of the glory of God, the manifestation of the glory of God, a future age of great glorious blessing that is ours in Jesus Christ. And that we are able to rejoice right now. That's what we saw this morning. But as we continue through this passage, we see that our joy doesn't just look forward to heaven. It survives and it thrives despite all the fiery trials that we face in this age. It's not just joy in a future age. It's a joy that we can know in the present age. That's the message of verses 3 through 5. Not only that, Paul writes, not only that hope in the glory of God, that future manifestation of glory, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, in our sufferings. And that's what we think about tonight. We think about a God-given joy that exists in suffering, a joy that can look right into the face of the reality of all of the troubles that we face in this life and still know that it is blessed. Three things I want to share this evening, each having to do with trials. The first one is this, trials test the reality of our faith. We rejoice in our suffering, so let's think about those sufferings for a moment. Never forget the word we. I pointed that out this morning, I want to underscore it tonight. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, we Everything that he says here only applies to one group of people. The we speaks of those who have salvation in Jesus Christ, those who have truly believed, those who have justification by faith, those who have peace with God, 
those who have access to God, those who are stationed in the grace of God, only those people can know the kind of joy that he's describing in these verses. We need to be clear, these This joy will not be found in people who merely profess faith in Jesus. It will only be found in people who possess salvation in Jesus Christ, whose faith is genuine, real. What is saving faith? As we've talked about on many occasions, it's not just intellectual assent. It's not just an intellectual agreement with gospel facts. True saving faith is... The result of regeneration granted by the Holy Spirit is an understanding. It is is nothing less than an enlightenment so that now you have a view of God that is saving in nature, a view of Christ that is saving in nature, a view of yourself that is accurate in nature, a view of this world, a view of the age to come that is accurate. It believes God's revelation. Saving faith is an understanding that results in trust. We are a people who trust the God of the Bible. We trust the true and living God. We trust in His Son for the forgiveness of our sins, a right standing with God. But we trust in God for for everything, not just justification, but everything. Our trust is in Him. And one of the acid tests of whether or not you know that kind of trust is how do you respond to trials? We say we trust God. We say we trust His Son for the salvation of our souls. But do we trust His Son through all the events of our lives? How can you say, how can I say that we trust Christ to save our souls forever if we don't trust Christ to shepherd our souls now? Through all the things that we walk through, all the things that we face, is He trustworthy? Is He trustworthy? This is one of the evidences that you have genuine faith. You do trust Him. When you go through trials, do they serve to develop you, thus demonstrating the presence of saving faith? Or when you go through trouble, does it destroy what you call faith? One of the things you see in apostates, oftentimes when people leave the faith, they walk away from what they have previously professed concerning Jesus. Oftentimes what has happened is they've gone through some traumatic event that has destroyed what they called trust in God. You see this in the parable of the soils. Matthew chapter 13 verse verse 20 says, As for what was sown on rocky ground... This is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. What they claimed to be faith couldn't stand up to the tribulation, the persecution that arises on account of the word of God. It couldn't stand up to the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches, and thus it was proven to be false, empty. The kind of faith, as James puts it, that doesn't save. Can that faith save him? The faith of devils? If you've been saved for very long, if you've been in the church for very long, you've seen this. People who who begin with great joy, they joyfully confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. And you see what looks like to us a good beginning, but they go through some event, some trouble, some test, some great trial, and, and first the change is in their countenance and in their interaction with the Lord's people, their, their joy, that, that initial 
joy that we thought was from God. It, it dissipates, and then before long, they wander away. The trouble could be financial, it could be relational, it could be circumstantial, it could be in their health, but they walk away from their profession of faith in Jesus Christ. At least, if they don't walk away from it verbally, they walk away from it practically. What happened? Did they lose salvation? No. No, what was revealed through the trials is that they never had it. Though they professed faith in Jesus, the kind of faith they had wasn't wasn't of the sort that it couldn't be extinguished. Isn't, Isn't it wonderful to know that the faith that you and I possess, if we are truly saved, is the gift of God, and it cannot be extinguished because God gave it and God sustains it. It is true that the saints persevere, but the reason why we persevere is because God preserves. And He preserves us, He keeps us by His power through faith. We keep on believing because He sustains the very belief that He granted to us. This is a great test of your salvation. What you call faith, does it let you down in your greatest time of need? You find yourself empty and without answers, without hope. Do you have a living God who is your God or just a God of the imagination? You know, this is something you see often in the Old Testament, the mocking of gods that are not gods. People constructing their own gods, making the gods of their liking, but then when they meet with trouble, where are those gods? There is no help from an imaginary God. But if we have come to truly know the God of the Bible through His Son, Jesus Christ, He is there. And when we have no strength to go on in ourselves, we meet with a strength that is beyond ourselves as He upholds us and sustains us and carries us forward. So the first thing I would say about these sufferings that Paul mentions is they become a great test of salvation. The we, do you belong to the we? We rejoice, we rejoice in our sufferings. Can you say that? The second thing we can say about this suffering, not only do trials test the reality of salvation, trials test what kind of joy you have. They're going to test the nature of your joy. Do you have a joy that is centered in, rooted in your circumstances? Or do you have a joy that belongs to the hope we learned about this morning? Do you have a joy that ultimately is found in God Himself. Remember we said this morning, it's really a state of mind, contentment, satisfaction, a sense of blessedness, despite all circumstances, that is found in God Himself. It it can be there when you're in your, your, your saddest moments. That's hope in God. Is that the kind of joy you have? Joy in God. I don't want to in any way ever present a a picture that is false when compared to the Scriptures. I want to be true to the Word of God. So we've got to be careful to say this. Christians do not suffer perfectly. We know great struggle in the midst of our sufferings. Sometimes great discouragement. Sometimes it could even feel like despair. And the Lord sustains us. So when Paul writes, we rejoice in our sufferings, he doesn't mean to say that we perfectly trust God through all of our suffering, that we perfectly keep the right perspective through all of our suffering, that we perfectly rejoice in our sufferings. No, Christians are not perfect in their sufferings, but they are perfected through their sufferings. God is at work in these troubles, growing us, developing us maturing us, teaching us. So we're not talking about perfection. We are, however, talking about pattern. This is the pattern of those who have genuine faith. This is the pattern of those who truly believe. Their faith, which is a God-given faith, triumphs over trials. 
in the final analysis. Trials don't conquer over your faith. Your God-given faith conquers over the trials. You trust the Lord through the trials. You are able to rejoice in God through the troubles. He's telling us here that we have joy in our sufferings. Philipsis is the word there for sufferings, afflictions, distresses, troubles, tribulations. No doubt persecution would be included in this. We are able to rejoice even when we are persecuted. We're, we're able to rejoice, as the parable of the soils mentions, when suffering comes because of the word. But I don't know that we can confine it to that like some commentators have. I don't think he's saying we just rejoice in those troubles that come because of our Christian faith. I think what he's saying is when the present time is sorrowful, no matter what kind of pressure it is we're facing. By the way, this word, Philips speaks of pressure. It was used of, of squeezing olives or squeezing grapes to, to get the juice this is what trials feel like. It's like you're in a vice. It's like you're under a weight. It's like you're in the midst of pressure. The Lord is telling us is that even when our lives are pressure-filled and sorrowful, when times are troubling, hard, afflicting, we know the joy of God because we are not in the dark. We are not a people who are living our lives in the dark. We are a people who are living our lives in the light. We have some knowledge, and it is certain knowledge, it is trustworthy knowledge from our God about what is going on. Have you ever thought to yourself, what is going on? But isn't it good to know that even when you say, what is going on, you can turn to the Scriptures and say, this is what is going on. I don't know all the answers as to what is going on, but I know certain things to be absolutely true with respect to whatever it is I'm facing. So we're a people who have a special kind of joy. It's it's going to triumph over the troubles. What I'm saying to you is a, a Christian is not someone who becomes bitter through the troubles of life. I'm not saying you never give in to moments of bitterness. I'm not saying that you never struggle with bitterness. I'm saying that it's not characteristic of the believer to be a bitter person. You meet with people who don't know Jesus, who go through some great tragedy or some great trouble in their life, and now they have a cynical, sour, dark outlook on everything. That's not not the Christian's perspective. Nor is the Christian someone who is just stoic through all of life's troubles. This is a counterfeit of joy. This This is what the flesh would produce, or this is what Satan would suggest to us, that true Christian joy is being unmoved by what goes on around us, numb to whatever it is that has happened. That's not true. It's not stoicism. It's not, it's not merely resigning yourself to your circumstances. I can't change it, so I might as well just go along with it. That's not Christian joy. Even our understanding of God's sovereignty shouldn't put us in a position where we would pretend that things that hurt don't hurt. That things that disappoint don't disappoint. We're a people who hurt, we weep, we feel. I see this especially in, in circles like ours where there is, there is this emphasis on biblical fidelity as obviously should be there. But sometimes there is this counterfeit that, that, that would insist that because we trust in the sovereignty of God, we're a people who never really hurt. Even when things are painful, put a smile on your face, have a stiff upper lip, keep your chin up. I believe there was a time when Job was devastated, but the Lord sustained him. Christianity is much, much more than just a stiff upper lip. Now, he says here, we rejoice 
in our sufferings. As we saw this morning, you boast in your sufferings. You glory in your troubles. Something here very, very important and unusual. The idea is not that we we glory in God in spite of tribulations. Despite my troubles, I'm going to go on glorying in God. No, it's more than that. It's not that we glory in God in the midst, simply in the midst of our tribulations. It's true. But it's more than that. But the Bible teaches that we're a people who are able to actually glory in the troubles themselves. I want to be careful. Hear me. I'm not saying that we say that everything we meet with in this life is good in and of itself. We don't glory in the thing itself as though the thing itself is good, but we are able to glory in the thing we're facing because we're not in the dark. I'll talk about that more in just a moment, but first just hear some passages that that give us this perspective. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you When others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Look at that persecution and understand the stream of faithfulness that puts you in and rejoice. In the persecution, yes, with the knowledge of what that persecution means. Is it right they're persecuting me? No. Is persecution good? No. But you can rejoice in the persecution because of what it means for faith in Christ. Acts chapter 5, verse 41. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Counted worthy. Lord, amazed that you would allow me the privilege to suffer for the name. Wouldn't you agree that that's an unusual perspective? That's a supernatural perspective. 2 Corinthians 4.16, so we do not lose heart, though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day for this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us. I mean, it's actually at work. It's, It's accomplishing something. It's preparing something. It is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look, not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient. But the things that are unseen are eternal. Do you understand that what you see and what is transient, though it is right to call it affliction when it's affliction, it is still in comparison to eternity slight. It is momentary and it is at work in the hand of God preparing for a glory that you will one day see. When you have that perspective, then when you meet with the affliction, you can rejoice over it. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, but he said to me, remember Paul pleading for the removal of the thorn in the flesh, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships. We talked about it this morning. These shouldn't just be words, phrases, descriptions that just wash over us. Is this, is this our reality? Is this what we walk in where we can say, I am content with the weaknesses? with the insults, with the hardships, he goes on to say, persecutions and calamities. For when I'm weak, 
then I am strong. And of course, he doesn't mean with the strength of his own. He means with the strength of God that you meet with in such circumstances. When I'm weak, he's strong. So it's more than putting up with trials. It's even more than being happy in the midst of trials. It's understanding that the trials in the hand of God are worked together for good so that I can look at the trials themselves and say, there's something here I can rejoice in. It's not, it's not good. It's not, it's not good in and of itself, but in the hand of God. It's something good. What I'm saying to you tonight is this. I mentioned it when I said we're not in the dark. We have knowledge in our sufferings. What kind of joy is it? It's a joy that flows from understanding, from knowledge. Verse 3, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Next word, knowing. You've got to just circle that word and <clears throat> let that really take root in your heart. We rejoice in our sufferings as we know certain things, as we have been taught certain things, as we call those things to mind, as we work through the logic that God gives us in His Word, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. This is a faith-driven joy, a knowledge-driven joy. True Christian joy doesn't begin in your emotions. Your emotions will lie to you. True Christian joy begins in a biblical way of viewing our lives. Let me see my life through the lens of Scripture. I want to give you a warning. I mentioned it this morning. I want to underscore it tonight. You, you need to beware faking Christian joy. We can do this sometimes even because of peer pressure. We, we've gone through some really heartbreaking thing and we, we, we feel obligated due to the pressure of knowing that all of our brethren are watching us to act as if we're responding to this thing as we think or as we imagine we should. I'm so thankful that genuine Christianity has no hypocrisy in it. I'm not saying that genuine Christians can't be hypocrites. I'm saying that when you meet with the real stuff, it's real. And even when a smile is on the face there can be sorrow in the heart, but the opposite is also true. There can be sorrow in your life and joy at the same time. You, you don't have to pretend to be joyful. No, what you have to do is, is know these things. Concentrate on these things. Remember these things. Remind yourself of these things. Realize that our troubles, far from working against our hope, are actually being used in the hand of God to contribute to our hope, to fuel our hope, to increase our faith. Notice in these verses that the troubles, the sufferings, are productive. We know that suffering produces endurance. And we know that the trickle down of that is endurance produces character and character produces hope. Remind yourself there's something productive taking place. Here's a test of our faith. Do we agree with God that no matter what it is we go through in this life, in His gracious, all-wise, merciful, undeserved plans for us, whatever it is we're going through in our life, it has, it has His hand on it in some way. He is at work in the midst of it. so that I can rejoice in that knowledge. Do you, do you agree, in other words, with the Bible's perspective of your trials? 
It's a test of your faith. So what is God working through our trials according to these verses? What is He doing? Well, we saw it, and I just want to remind you again, He's working out a purpose. He's producing something. There's a purpose at work. Things don't just happen to us randomly in our lives. Sovereignty has overseen every detail. God has a plan and a purpose for everything in His world, and that includes you. That includes your life. That includes your circumstances. That includes whatever it is that you faced this past week, whatever it is if the Lord Jesus should tarry and you should live, that you'll face this week. There's a purpose for it all. How can I rejoice in the face of some trouble? I know there's a purpose for it. Am I convinced of that? Should be. God's producing something. Suffering's not producing anything on its own. Suffering is producing endurance because of God. And endurance is producing character because of God. And character is producing hope because of God. God's hand is on these sufferings. God is working at a purpose. And God's purpose involves God working patience through our troubles. Endurance, he says. Suffering produces endurance, patience, steadfastness is the idea. Your troubles in the hand of God, I'm talking now to people who have genuine faith, your troubles in the hand of God are used by God for your perseverance. That you would continue in the faith, that you would continue, endure, be steadfast in your walk with Him. So how does that work out? Well, you go through suffering and you have, a, you have a sense, a fresh sense of your need for God. How many have discovered you pray more in the midst of trouble? <laughs> How many could admit, if you can be honest with yourself, that when everything is beautiful and the sun is always shining and, and there's no rain in the forecast, you don't think about the Lord as much? You don't think about His Word as much as when that great trial hits and now you're a little afraid. What does it do? It drives you to God, which is to say there is a fresh experience of humility, a sense of your mortality, a sense of your limitation a sense of your dependency, your weakness. I'm content with weaknesses because when I know my weakness, then I'm able to meet with His strength. Have you known that? Have you experienced that? That in those dark times, those sorrowful times, sad times, or testing times, pressure-filled times, you know you need God and it drives you lower in your view of yourself. That's a good thing. And those revived perspectives fuel your walk forward. Pride would lead us away from God. Pride would cause us to wander from God. And God loves us too much. He has taken hold of us. He won't let go. He loves us too much to have us wander. And so what does He do in His sovereign, perfect plan and purposes for our lives? But He sends the perfect recipe of storms our way in order to drive us to Him and to see ourselves accurately. What is God doing through your troubles? He's producing endurance, strength, stickability, faithfulness. He's teaching you these things through suffering. What he's also producing at the same time is character. Through that pressure, as you learn to continue in the midst of the pressure cooker of this fallen world, character is formed. And notice it is, it is a proven character. Approved of God. The very character of His Son. 
Because it produces hope. The character produces hope. That is to say, God works through your trouble in a way that you're able to see God put into your life the kind of character of Christ that wasn't there before, and with every additional growth in the Christian life, there is more and more evidence that God has really saved you, and that increases your expectation. Lord, if not for your hand on my life, this would have driven me away from you, but because you have graciously taken hold of my life, this has driven me to you, and as I've been driven to you, you have taught me, you have taught me the very character of your son. You have increased in my life things that that were not there before. And this indicates to me that what I have called saving faith really is. You are able to see that the Lord has really saved you when you see him put himself on display in your life through your troubles. It encourages you in the knowledge this is all meaningful. It's all headed somewhere. And with the eyes of faith, you're able to see where it's all headed. Your hope in future glory is increased as your hope increases through present pain. And the chief evidence of this you see in his final statement. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing That suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And you're not going to be disappointed. You're not going to be put to shame one day. Hope does not put to shame. That hope, that expectation, founded in the Scriptures, based on the Gospel, trusting in Christ, you will not be disappointed because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, all of this activity that we've described tonight, it is all being applied personally. The comforter, our helper, the one who has come to reside in believers who manifest the very presence of Jesus himself in the believer's life, the Holy Spirit has been given to us. He is at work in the midst of the sufferings so that they produce endurance. He is at work through the suffering so that that endurance produces character. He is at work through the suffering so that that character produces increased hope, assurance of salvation, the knowledge that God has really saved me. The Spirit Himself testifies to us that we are the children of God and He's working through the sufferings to confirm what God has done in each of our cases. He's there. And as He is working, it is all in this realm of love. It all testifies to love that is greater than ours. God has loved us. You look down at verse 8, but God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is salvation story, not our love for God, as the book of 1 John says, but God's love for us. And God's hand upon us in the midst of all of our troubles says God loves us, cares for us. None of our sorrows are wasted. That's the greatest love, but at the same time, And what is a supernatural testimony to what God has done, because what He's done is supernatural, is that in the midst of all those troubles, sorrows, pains that produce endurance and character and hope, in the midst of all of that is this inextinguishable, undeniable love for God that has been poured out in our hearts by God's Spirit. Oh, Lord, I have nowhere to go. Pressure's high. The troubles are sore. But I know you love me, and I love you. And though I, if left to me, I, I might choose a different way, your wisdom is perfect. 
That very knowledge is a confession of love, isn't it? A love for the God of the Bible. Your wisdom is perfect. Your ways are good. As Job was able to say, if he slays me, I'll trust him. As the psalmist said, all those who know the name of God put their trust in him. If you really know who God is, you trust him. And that's an expression of God's love poured out in your heart that you are one who trusts God. This is our joy. We know a joy that is present and fueled by the knowledge of what God has promised concerning the future, but we also know a joy at the same time. I love the way Paul words that. Not only that, he says in verse 3, not only that, but at the very same time, we are those who rejoice. We are those who rejoice in our troubles, sufferings, afflictions, knowing, not in the dark, knowing that God is working through all of these things in a way that contributes to what he has destined us for. Paul's going to bring this home powerfully. Remember I said to you, the theme of these chapters all the way to chapter 9 is security, the security of salvation. And he's going to drive this point home, look real quickly, Romans 8, you know these verses well, but see them with your eyes. He drives this home, including the personal working of God himself in our lives. In Romans chapter 8, verse 26, when he writes, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. You know, when you're saying, what's going on? (laughs) You don't even know how to pray. He's there. He's at work. The Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose, for those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. You will get home. You're as good as already there in the mind and purposes of God. So Christian, I exhort you tonight to rejoice. Rejoice in heaven, rejoice in your future, but rejoice right now. And whatever it is you're facing, whatever it is that has you feeling pressure, know that God is there. His hand is on it. Trust Him right in the midst of it. Rejoice because of it knowing that it won't be wasted. The character of His Son is being formed in you, and as you see more and more of that character, your knowledge of what God has done in your life will increase. You will be able to have an increased hope for what God is doing in your life is undeniable. The church would say, amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. For your great mercy to us in Jesus, Lord, when we read and study and think about what you have said concerning your people, what you have given us assurances of, what you have promised us you're doing, when we see these things, we see we are so undeserving of any of it, but we are grateful that you have loved us, shown us mercy, redeemed us, delivered us brought us to yourself, poured out your love in our hearts. We hold on to you, but it's because you're holding on to us. Thank you that you preserve us, you keep us in, by your power in faith until we meet with the glory that will be revealed, the glory that all creation groans for 
and that we ourselves groan for within ourselves because we await the redemption of our bodies. Lord, let these things remain in our minds and hearts so that we can work through the logic of it all the next trial we face. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.